Hello and welcome to today's session. This session is for the business administration learners and today we are going to be focusing on record and document production and we are also going to be having a brief look at policies within your organisation. I am Leanne Peters, I am your trainer for today and my contact details will be left at the end of this presentation. Just a bit of an introduction here, health and safety, and uh, we are completing online learning due to the coronavirus pandemic. If you do have any safeguarding concerns, please contact Marie Spence or Tracy Turner. They are Best Choice Training Safeguarding Leads and their details are provided at the end of this presentation. Everyone is going to be given the opportunity to give their opinion and ask questions regarding this presentation. You'll be provided with my email address, which you can voice your opinions and ask questions. And it will also make sure everyone has inclusivity within the groups. We are adhering to British values. Everyone here is in different age, religions and gender. And we will be discussing behaviours and legislations. If you do have anything you'd like to discuss or you'd like me to make a forum, within different learners for this topic. I'm more than happy to do that so we can have an opinion through discussion. On the agenda today, we are going to be starting off with record and documentation production. Then we are going to briefly look at policies and then have a look at the workbook that you are to complete. You are to complete different tasks throughout this presentation, which needs to be uploaded onto one file after one week of this video, of watching this video, and these will be marked against your qualification. In the last session, we looked at communication and you were able to understand the term communication. You demonstrated understanding of verbal and non-verbal communications, understood how different tones within media can affect branding, and we also recapped on British values, prevent duty and health and safety. The aims and objectives of today, you are to understand record and document production, understand the organisation's internal policies and key business policies relating to sector. And today you are going to produce accurate records and documents, including emails, letters, files, payments, reports and proposals. These records need to be consistently accurate and confidential. You are also going to make recommendations for improvement and prevent sol present solutions to management. Recommendations are insightful, clearly recorded and result in a clear benefit to the organisation. And you are going to draft a correspondence where you will write a report and review other work. And finally, to understand, follow and promote the organisation's internal policies. Just a brief introduction, the Business Administrator Apprenticeship is a minimum of 12 months and should be typically be completed within 18 months. The last three months is for your EPA endpoint assessment. Your apprenticeship provides a highly transferable set of knowledge, skills and behaviours which will be gained through working across your organisation and its processes. You as an apprenticeship will ground gain a firm grounding in organisational op operations and functional processes as well as a wider working environment. As a learner, you are expected to work independently and take responsibility for the outcomes of your work with the support of your employer and best choice training. Through working across functional areas, you will build a team of relationship quickly and learn from others to develop specific set skills. The need to communicate and represent your work clearly will be reflected in the assessment methods of the Endpoint Assessment, also known as EPA. The assessment methodology provides fair, valid and rigorous assessments across your learning outcomes of the standards and guidelines on completing the assessment. Once you have completed your 12 months and enter the EPA, you will have a portfolio based interview and this will last around 30 to 45 minutes and you are scored out of 100 by the independent endpoint assessment organisation. Your portfolio of learning will provide the structure of this conversation and also your portfolio should contain at least one piece of evidence for each of the minimum KSBs. 
This will be submitted to the EPAO a month prior to the interview. And the interview will assess your understanding and learning shown in the portfolio. The portfolio is not directly assessed. The interview assesses your understanding of the portfolio to validate competence shown, self-reflection of performance, demonstrating knowledge and how appropriate skills and behaviours have been applied, judgment and understanding to explain appropriate examples. Your portfolio of learning will contain evidence of a minimum of eight to 12 pages, is expected for consistency. At least one of each of the minimum knowledge, skills and behaviours as outlined by the Annex Methods and Grading Table. There will be practical observation or, or evaluations by your employer to be included, such as acknowledgement of a skill shown or evidencing work completed on a particular project within manager's comments, which is then discussed at the interview. The knowledge of the portfolio is to be assessed at interview by the EPA. Best Choice Training will be responsible for providing guidance on complying your portfolio on programme, which is to be reviewed by your employer and Best Choice Training prior to triggering the EPA. Your employer should provide suitable work for you to apply yourselves to and discuss at the interview. The EPA happens after the 12 months and then will follow three months after. Now we are going to explore record and document production. Administrative record. They are data collected for the purpose of carrying out various non-statistical programs. Using administrative records presents a number of advantages to a statistical agency and to its analysis. The administrative record is the paper trail that documents the company's decision making processes and the basis for the company's decisions. What I'd like you to do now is think about what record do you have to work with at your organisation. Take some time, write these down. So what records do you have to work with at your organisation? Pause this video and write a list of records that you have to work with within your organisation. And if you'd like to stretch yourself further, you can also explain how and what legislation do you comply to when you work with these records? Please upload this onto your one file, one week of watching this video and it will be assessed. Thank you for completing that. Please upload it onto one file. Production data is data that is essential to completing day-to-day -day business tasks and processes. Production data must be readily available for frequent and efficient access and is stored persistently. Production data is information that is persistently stored and used by professionals to conduct business processes. It must be accurate, documented and managed on an ongoing basis to ensure its value to the organisation. What is a letter? As part of your apprenticeship, you may be asked to write a letter to a client, a patient or other stakeholders. A letter is a written or printed communication addressed to a person or organisation and usually transmitted by mail. What I'd like you to do is answer this question. Why do you write letters in your organisation? What is their purpose? Spend some time reflecting on why do you write letters in your organisation? What are they used for? Do they benefit the business? Who are they sent to? Please also upload this onto your one file. What is an email? An email is short for electronic mail. Similar to a letter, it is sent by the internet to a recipient. An email address is required to receive an email, and that address is unique to the user. Some people use internet-based applications and some use programs on the computer to access and store emails. The key benefits and features of using an email are, they are quick. They receive the email as soon as they go online and collect their email. It is also secure. It is also low cost. 
and photos, documents and other files can be attached onto an email so that more information can be shared. And also one email can be sent to more than one person at a time. I'm Jamila Musaifa, an international social etiquette consultant and the author of the book Etiquette, the least you need to know. A lot of my followers on Instagram have requested me to do an emailing etiquette video, so this video is dedicated to exactly that. We cannot imagine, imagine our, our lives today, today uh, without writing, writing an email. email. We wake up answering an email, we go to bed responding or writing an email to someone, so it's an inextricable part of our daily lives. So, unfortunately, in schools, they don't teach us how to write a good email. I decided to make a video specifically for those that want to acquire a better emailing skill. Make sure you take a notebook, a pen, and write down some tips that I'm going to be sharing with you today. By the way, if you're a new viewer, make sure you subscribe. And if you're an old subscriber already, please don't forget to like and leave your comment down below in this video and let me know what you think. So first and foremost, what is an email? An email is an electronic mail that was first introduced in the 1960s. Back then, only the users of the same computer could exchange emails. But with the advent of better technology and faster Wi-Fi, we're now able to send emails miles and miles away from different devices, whether it be laptop, our iPhones, or iPads. And so now this is something that we are practicing every single day and this is a skill that we need to perfect in order to become a very good email writer. A lot of you can even ask me why do I even need to have a good emailing skill? First and foremost because a lot of what you're going to be doing after school, let it be writing to your university, working with your partners on a project, applying for an internship, doing your work, most of that will be done through emails. So emailing is your way to show your professionalism, your ability to speak a language. So your proper English, if you're writing in English, Russian, if you're writing in Russian and other languages, as well as your ability to communicate, your ability to self-express. Because really, the person on the receiving end might not know you personally or might not feel what you're feeling. So writing a good email is your ability to self-express and let the receiver know how you're feeling and what you're feeling. Sometimes an email can decide your life, can decide whether you're getting an internship or not, whether you're getting that offer that you really want. Um, for example, you're applying for an internship and a poorly written email will leave a really bad impression of you and you might not even get invited to that internship interview. The same can be with your work. Um, basically what I'm trying to say is emailing is an important skill that you need to acquire and the better you do it, the better opportunities you're going to have along your way. And the earlier you start practicing, the better off you're going to be when you finish school and when you go to university and when you start work. So let's start with the email address. If you set up an email address, unless it's already given to you at work, uh, you should opt for choosing a combination of your first and last name, or maybe just your last name or your first name. Sometimes all these options are taken, so you have to include some numbers, and that's permissible. But please stay away from options like Dog Lover123 or Spice Girl 777 the, regardless of your loves and your interests and your hobbies, please make sure not to use that email address when you're writing with, to an internship or for a work opportunity or anything that's for professional use. Of course, you can use that for emailing your friends and family, but definitely never use that to email something or someone in a professional way. Because imagine the person that's receiving that email doesn't know you personally. So all they get an email from a dog lover one, two, three, it's likely that they're not even gonna open that email because it doesn't sound very serious. It sounds much like a spam. It doesn't make a good impression of you. So stay away from that at all costs. Now let's dive into the more technical parts of an email. 
there is in the beginning the line that says to. A to is the address of the person who's going to receive your email and has to take an action requested in your email. So if you want only one person to take an action, you include his or her email address there. If you want two people to take an action um, on your email, then you will include two people, both of them in the line that says to. What I mean by that is, for example, you're asking for an opinion or some information uh, to complete a project, and you want two of your colleagues to give you feedback or give you opinion or share with you with some information, then you'll include both of them in the two line. A two line is intended for those people that you expect to write you back with a certain action or a certain request that you had. So this is only reserved for those people. They must reply to your email. Next comes the CC line. The CC stands for carbon copy. This is basically a way for you to copy your email to someone that you also want to get a chance to read it. But you don't necessarily expect them to take an action upon that email. So you don't expect them to give you any information, you don't expect them to share their opinion, you just want them to know that you have sent this email to the receiver. These people of course can give their feedback, but it's not expected of them. So for example, let's say you are sending an email to your assistant asking her to change your schedule. You also want other work partners in your firm to know that you have changed your schedule, but you don't necessarily want them to change your schedule. What you'll do is you'll put your assistant in the two line, but you would CC your colleagues or your work partners to let them know that your schedule has been changed. Right after CC comes the BCC line. The BCC stands for blind carbon copy. This means that whoever you include in the BCC will be able to see who is in CC and who is in two, but those in two and CC will not see those in BCC. This BCC line should be used very carefully in specific cases when you want to protect the privacy of the people that are included in BCC. Continuing with the example of our assistant, we put our assistant to two because we want them to change our schedule. We put our work partners in CC because we want them to know that our schedule has been changed. And then we put our CEO or our boss or director into BCC because we don't want our work partners or our assistant to see his or her email address, but we want the boss to know as well that our schedule has been changed. Right after BCC comes the subject line. What is a subject line for? It's basically a summary of your email, what you want in your email to be done. So if you're requesting your schedule to be changed, that should be said clearly, precisely, very briefly in your subject line. Why the subject line is important? That's because people every day get the hundreds, I don't know, thousands of emails and this gives them an idea of what your email is going to be about. It helps to catch the eye of the person who's going to receive the email. Say you're sending your assistant an email and there are hundreds of other emails there and this is something you need to be urgently done. So you put in a subject line, this is urgent. So she gets a chance to when she's skimming through the email to see what is that that should be done urgently. The same would be for example if you're applying for an internship opportunity. If you send it without a subject line, the receiver will not know what your email is about. And if they don't know your email address, they're most probably likely to ignore it. So what you have to do is write interested in your internship program. And that will let them know that what this email entails. I want to emphasize this again, that the subject line should never be ignored, even when you're in a hurry. And try to limit it to 10 words or below, but not more than that. This is not the main part of your email. This is just a summary. How do we start an email? We start an email with a greeting, with a salutation. In a formal email, it should be dear. If we don't know the name of a man, it should be dear sir. If we don't know the name of a woman, it should be dear madam. If we know the name and the last name of a person, we should say dear Mr. John Smith or dear Mrs. Uh, Samantha John. We should include both last and first name. If the person signed off his email only with a name, we're free to use that name when we're addressing them. So let's say, Dear Samantha or Dear John, if that's how they signed off their email. If we're writing, say, to a person that we know is a colleague of ours, then we can say, Hi or Hello, followed by a name. This is more informal greeting way. If we're writing a business correspondence, we should address to whom it may concern. 
If we are writing to a lot of people, we should not obviously include all their names, so we should salute them as dear all. If we're writing to two people, then we should include both of their names, dear John and Samantha, or dear Mr. John and Mrs. Samantha. Right after the foundation, dear Mr. John, comma, we have to introduce ourselves. If this is the first time we are writing to that person, we should let them know who we are and why we are writing to them. This part should be brief, one or two sentences, and straight to the point. You don't have to write your whole CV there. You don't have to write your whole life story there. Keep it brief and sweet. Now comes the most important part of the email, and that's the body paragraph. Make sure that you don't write lengthy, long emails. Unless this is to your friend that you haven't seen in a year time and maybe you're sharing your life story with them, then that might be permissible. But if you're writing a formal email, keep it short, clear, straight to the point. But just like an essay, you should treat your email with a lot of love and with a lot of respect. Make sure you check for grammar, punctuation marks, any spelling errors, because that will not be acceptable in a formal email. Take some time to review it, reread it before sending it. Also, stay away from using any emojis or smileys like you would in a WhatsApp or through Instagram because emails are not for that. If you're writing in English language, make sure that you write in full, proper sentences. Avoid using bullet points unless this is to your colleague or maybe a friend uh, giving some recap of the discussion points or the meeting points, then it's permissible. But if you're writing a formal email, write in full, long sentences with proper grammar and proper punctuation marks. Also, if you want to say that something is important, don't put it in capital letters, don't write full sentences in capital letters, don't add a lot of exclamation marks, because this can be translated into aggressiveness or too much excitedness, which is something you don't want to say or you don't want to translate. If you want to say that something is urgent, you can put it into bold, maybe one word or the word important or urgent, you can put it into bold. When it comes to the size and the style of your font, make sure that you use a legible font. The recommended ones are Ariel, Garamond, Helvetica. Stay away from th something that's difficult to read, uh, calligraphy kind of writing like the brush script. Use the regular size, say 12 or 10, and make sure you don't underline bold or italic the whole email. That just doesn't look professional and definitely stay away from using bright colors or different kinds of colors. Finally, we end the email with a sign-off. Uh, for formal emails, we should sign off using cordially, sincerely, best wishes, best regards, yours sincerely, or looking forward to hearing from you soon, comma, and our last name and first name, or just our first name. The way you sign off your email will let the receiver know that this is how you want him or her to address you. So if I sign off an email saying sincerely Jamila, he or she has the right to answer to me as dear Jamila. If I sign off as Jamila Musayeva, then he or she will have to address me as dear Miss Musayeva. And finally, to wrap it up, right below your name should come your information, your contact information, perhaps your website or the company that you work at, the email address, and uh, maybe the fax number. So the person who is receiving the email, if he or she needs to contact you immediately, he or she can do that by simply looking up the email and seeing your contact information right below your name. If you want to attach some files to your email, and this is a form of correspondence, you should first ask the receiver for permission to send him or her some files. If this is an informal correspondence, then feel free to attach the file right away with the email. If you are sending a large format files, then make sure to convert them into smaller size to zip it and then send it because this shows that you're mindful of the receiver's um, memory space in their laptop or computer. Uh, you don't want to send really large files that's difficult to download and store. If you just send only one file, make sure you convert it into PDF to avoid any kind of compatibility issues later on. To all my students, I always recommend attaching the files first before writing the body paragraph of the email. This will make sure that you will send an email with the attachment in it. 
oftentimes we get an email that says, see the attachment below, and there is no attachment, because the person writing was so busy checking the email that he or she forgot to attach the file. In order to avoid that and sending again a new email with an attachment separately, wasting your own time and the time of the receiver, please make sure you attach the file first and then write the email. Now you're ready to send your email. Before sending it, please make sure you reread it, skim through all potential spelling, punctuation mark or grammar errors, see if you have attached the file that you said you were going to attach and now you're ready to send the email. If you're receiving the email, however, and you have to reply to people and there are, let's say, multiple people in the CC and you intend to only reply to the sender of the email and accidentally you hit the reply all button, that can actually lead to so many dramatic situations, so many undesirable situations. Make sure that you check that you are replying to the person that you intend to reply instead of hitting the reply all button. Just giving you an example, you're invited to a, some kind of a party at work and there's a person X that's invited to the party, he or she is in a CC and you really don't like this person, you don't get very well along with that person and you want to respond to the person who has invited you that I'm sorry, I don't feel very comfortable around this person, I'm not going to come to this party unfortunately and you hit reply all. So now everyone in this email can see why you're not coming, what is the reason for that, and that will put you, the receiver, as well as the person X in a very uncomfortable situation. In order to avoid that, always check before hitting reply. If you have received an email, give yourself 24 hours limit to respond to that email. If for some reason you're not able to respond within that 24 hour limit, make sure you respond with a simple, thank you, received your email, will get back to you as soon as I can. Thus, letting the sender know that you have received the email and you will pay attention or respond when you have time. This is an important point that I'm making in all my classes. This leaves a very good impression of you. This shows how professional you are in your work. Now, a final message to all of you that are using emails to send some personal files and pictures, some personal information, be aware that emails are a public domain. They're stored in software programs, especially the corporate emails. They don't belong to you. Your company owns them. It has access to it. Even if you have deleted those, they've been deleted in your inbox, but they are there. They're stored there so anyone can access it when they need it. Um, therefore, you should treat emails with extra care. Do not send any personal information or pictures through your corporate email address. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you found this information useful and applicable in your daily lives. And I'm going to move on to now what is a report. So a report is written for a clear purpose and to a particular audience. Specific information and evidence are presented, analysed and applied to a particular problem or issue. The information that is presented in a clear structured format, making use of sections and headings so that the information is easy to locate and follow. When you are asked to write a report, you will be usually given a report brief which provides you with instructions and guidelines. The report brief may outline the purpose, audience and problem or issue that your report must address, together with any specific requirements for the format or structure. A computer file is a computer resource for recording data discreetly in a computer storage device. Just as words can be written to paper, so can information be written into a computer file. There are different types of computer files designed for different purposes. A file may be designed to store a picture, a written message, a video, a computer program, or a wide variety of other kinds of data. Some files can store several types of information at once. By using a computer program, a person can open, read, change, and close a computer file. These files may be reopened, modified and copied by an arbitrary number of times. Typically, these files are organised within a file system, which keeps track of where the file is located on disk and enables user access. What are payments? It is the transfer 
of one form of good, service or financial asset in exchange for another from a form of a good, service or financial asset in proportions that have been made previously agreed upon by all parties involved. Payments can be made in the form of funds, assets or services. What I'd like you to do is think about who records these payments. Are you expected to make any payments or take any payments while you are in your apprenticeship? Have a think and just write these answers down. What is a proposal? A business proposal is a written offer from a seller to a prospective buyer. Business proposals are often a key step in the complex sales process. So, for example, whenever a buyer considers more than a price in a purchase. A proposal puts the buyer's requirements in a context that favours the seller's products and services and educates the buyer about the capabilities of the seller in satisfying their needs. Data accuracy is one of the, of the components of data quality. It refers to whether the data values stored for an object are correct values. To be correct, a data value must be the right value and must be represented in a consistent and definitive form. So for example, my birthday is the 13th, 1941. Confidentiality is the protection of personal information. It means that keeping a client's information between you and the client and not telling others, including co-workers, friends and family. Examples of maintaining confidentiality include Individual files are locked and secured, and you also do not tell other people what is in the client's files unless they have permission from the client. Information about clients is not told to people who do not need to know. This includes medical details that they are not discussed without their consent. And adult clients have the right to keep any information about themselves confidential, which includes that information being kept from family and friends. What we need to do now is complete your tasks. So the first task is a job application form. You are required to work individually and complete the job application form handed to you. You will be able to access these through the resource section. If you have any problems, send me an email and I can email them over to you, but they will, all of the tasks will be uploaded onto one form. Your job application will contain confidential information about you, which you input. After completion, you will need to write a statement at the bottom of page two and state what you did and how you think your information should be handled as if it contains confidential information. This is task one. For your job application, I would not include your personal address to keep it confidential. Just to write down all of your previous job histories and your personal statement there. And remember, after completion, you will need to write a statement at the bottom of page two and state what you did and how you think your information should be handled as if it contains confidential information. Please upload this onto one file. Task two. Your next task is to write a report. You will now create an incident report. I will give the resource for the template will also be on one file. And here you will be able to demonstrate how you write a report. Please send your report to one file and write a statement to say what you did and use the timesheet section in your portfolio tab to demonstrate the amount of time spent on any task through any presentation. You will have to complete the details on the incident form. Please do not use your own details or your colleagues. You can make up a name and please save your instant report forms as you'll need it for the next task. Task three is to write an email. Now that you have created your incident report form, you are required to send an email to the health and safety officer. This email will have you explain the incident and attach the incident report form. Please ensure that you are using a formal format for your email. 
Again, please upload this onto one file and use the timesheet section to write a statement about what you did. We are going to take a short, brief break from those communications there and report writing and document production. And what I'd like you to do is test your mathematical knowledge by answering all 15 of these questions. If you just pause this video, write these down and send me over the answers via one file also. You can attach it to any other document that you've made. Good luck. Now we're going to look at part two, which is policies. A policy is a statement which underpins how human resources management issues can be dealt with in an organization. It communicates an organization's values and the organization's expectations of an employee, behaviors and performance. They often reinforce and clarify standard operating procedures in the workplace. Well-written policies help employees manage staff more effectively by clearly defining acceptable and unacceptable behaviours in the workplace and set out the implications of not complying with these procedures. A workplace policy consists of a statement of purpose and one or more broad guidelines in action to be taken to achieve that purpose. The statement of purpose should be written in simple terms, free of jargon. The length of the policy may vary depending on the issue it addresses. Furthermore, a policy may allow discretion in its implementation and the basis of that discretion, which should be stated as part of the policy. A policy may also be required where there is diversity of interests and preferences, which could result in vague and conflicting objectives among those who are directly involved. Internal companies policies are set out documented guidelines that establish standards in areas, for example, such as proper procedures and employee behaviour. In many cases, internal policies must meet certain legal requirements, such as those regarding employees' right to privacy. The policies your employer choose to implement will vary depending on the nature of the business and their own management philosophy. Here are a few examples of widely used policies. Substance abuse can affect employees' attendance and productivity. In work environments such as construction or handling hazardous materials, it can pose a safety risk. Many companies institute a policy regarding disciplinary measures for work-related substance abuse, such as terminating the worker for consuming alcohol in the workplace. They must also provide a method for employees to seek confidential guidance or treatment when dealing with a substance abuse problem such as an employee assistance program. Dress code. Some companies require employees to dress in a certain manner on the job. In an office environment, male workers may have to wear a tie, while women may have to dress in appropriate business attire to promote a professional atmosphere. Workers who deal with the public often must wear a uniform to promote the company's brand or to provide easy recognition for customers. A common example is a UPS driver's distinctive brown uniform. Companies may also implement a policy governing the use of computers within the workplace in an effort to increase productivity and limit internet surfing. They may also place limitations on sending, receiving personal emails or instant messages. Security constant co conscious companies may require employees to sign a release that allows employers to monitor email and internet activity. This will help ensure that confidential information stays within the organisation and prevents employees from sending threatening or hash harassing emails to colleagues. Working for others. A policy limiting an employee's ability to work for others may exist to protect the employer. The company may prohibit an employee from working for a competitor on a part-time basis to prevent the disclosure of confidential information. If an employer leaves the company to work for a competitor, they may be required to sign a non-compete agreement 
that prevents her from doing business with or even approaching the company's clients for a specified period of time. Type of key policies, code of conduct, recruitment policy, internet and email policy, mobile phone, non-smoking, drug and alcohol, health and safety, anti-discrimination and harassment, grievance handling, discipline and termination, using social media. So what are the benefits of policies within the workplace? They are consistent within the values of the organisation, also, the policies comply with the employment and other associated legislations. They demonstrate that the organisation is being operated in an efficient and business-like manner. They also ensure standardisation and consistency in decision-making and operational procedures. They also add strength to the position of staff when possible legal action arises. And policies in the workplace can save time when a new problem can be handled quickly and effectively for an existing policy. They also foster stability and continuality. They maintain the direction of the organisation even during periods of change, such as coronavirus. They provide the framework for business planning and they assist in the assessing of performance and establishing accountability of employees and clarify functions and responsibilities. That is everything for policies. What you need to do now is complete a workbook to demonstrate your knowledge and understanding. And you can use internet research for this and you must work individually. You'll be able to find the workbook uploaded into the resource section on one file. Please upload your completed workbook onto one file for marking after one week of this video being watched. We are now going to recap on British values. So we have covered product documentation, policies, and now we're going to have a look at British values. The five British values are democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, mutual respect, and tolerance of those with different faiths and beliefs. These are your five British values. You are more than welcome to conduct some research in your own time, which will go towards your 20% off the job hours. The five British values are democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, mutual respect, and the tolerance of those with different faiths and beliefs. Prevent. The prevent duty is the duty of the Counter-Terrorism and Security Act 2015 on specified authorities in the exercise of their functions to have due regard to the need to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. What is safeguarding? Safeguarding is protecting vulnerable adults or children from abuse or neglect. It means making sure people are supported to get good access to healthcare and stay well. It is wrong if pe vulnerable people are not treated by professionals with the same respect as their other patients. These six principles are safeguarding are empowerment. People should be supported and encouraged to make their own decisions. This should done, be done by making services more personal, giving people more choice and control over their decisions, asking what people, asking people what they want the outcome to be. Prevention. Organisations to work together to stop abuse before it happens by raising awareness about abuse and neglect training staff and also to make sure clear, simple and accessible information is available about abuse and where people can get help. Proportionately, when dealing with abuse situations, services must ensure that they always think about the risk. Any response should be appropriate to the risk presented. Services must respect the person and think about what is best for them and only get involved as much as needed. Protection. Organisations must ensure that they know what to do when abuse has happened by knowing what to do if there are any concerns, how to stop the abuse and how to offer help and support for people who are at risk. The fifth is partnership. 
Organisations should work in partnership with each other and local communities. Local people also have a part to play in preventing, detecting and reporting abuse. Everyone is responsible for reporting safeguarding. And accountability. Safeguarding is everyone's business. Everyone must accept that we are all accountable as individuals, services and as organisations. Roles and responsibilities must be clear so that people can see and check how safeguarding is done. Equality and diversity. Equality and diversity is a term used in the United Kingdom to define and champion equality, diversity and human rights as defining values of society. It promotes equality of opportunities for all, giving every individual the chance to achieve their potential free from prejudice and discrimination. The protected characteristics also include age, gender, nationality, disability, pregnancy and marital status. Health and safety. Regulations and procedures intended to prevent accidents or injury within the workplaces or public environments. All workers are entitled to work in environments where risks to their health and safety are probably controlled. Under the health and safety law, the primary responsibility for this is down to the employers. Employers have a duty to consult with their employees on their representatives and on health and safety matters. E-safety. E-safety is a term which means not only on the internet but also in other ways that young people communicate using electronic media, for example mobile phones. E-safety means ensuring that children and young people are protected from harm and supported to achieve the maximum benefit from new and developing technologies without risk to themselves or others. The aim of promoting e-safety is to protect young people from the adverse consequences of access or use of electronic media, including from being bullied, inappropriate sexualised behaviour or exploitation. For your homework, you are required to write a proposal to managers within your organisation on making a recommendation for improvement. So you are required to write a proposal to management within your organisation and making a recommendation for, for improvement. Please upload this onto one file within one week of watching this video. Please not send to your managers, send to myself for marking and we can discuss this further. You need to make sure you structure your proposal professionally and remember this needs to be a formal letter. Recommendations or improvements can include whether there's sufficient training, do you want more training, do staff want more training, maybe to employ more staff, do you have too much of a workload, flexibility, so including work-life balance. You must also explain why this recommendation will improve and benefit the organisation. Because you are business administration learners, this needs to be a recommendation that is based around business administration. You could offer a new structure for filing. Could you implement a new form? So what have you learned today? What I'd like you to do is write a reflection on what you have learned today from this presentation. And you're more than welcome to give me feedback. There will be feedback forms at the end of the session provided also. And I look forward to your feedback and your reflection. In the next session, we are going to be looking at decision making within the workplace. And we will also recap on equality, diversity, health and safety, prevent and safeguarding. Thank you very much for joining this session. And I look forward to seeing you in the next session. If you do have any questions, please do not hesitate to answer me, ask me. Many thanks.